Hello. Our story begins outside of the funeral of Padme Amidala. Ahsoka was here, and so were many people that not only greatly respected Padme, but adored her for who she was. Ahsoka watched with a hood over her head from the crowd. The procession was deathly still and truthfully terrible. The vibrant colors that once called Naboo home became dissonant in the funeral of their former queen. The friends and family were all gathered. Ahsoka herself was quietly standing in the crowd before eventually dispersing and running into Bail Organa on the outskirts of the funeral. They didn't have much time to talk, and due to incoming troopers, Ahsoka had to escape to the roof of the Overlook. She listened to Bail as he told the clones a message that was meant for her. It left her more confused than ever before, but she at least knew that she had a friend to confide in if she needed. Ahsoka turned over and jumped off the roof, and instead of falling to the ground, she slipped through the force and landed in a chasm of nothingness. She fell flat on her face too, and was very confused. It came out of nowhere. She turned over and looked around. There were portals all across the landscape, and she didn't really understand it. A voice called out and she turned around. Due to her not knowing Anakin's fate, she found this kind of odd, and she called out to him. He told her that he had a lot to reveal. What followed was something that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to her. Anakin Skywalker was a guardian of the world between worlds. He had died on the second Death Star and had access to a multitude of events across the history of the galaxy. Anakin was able to see beyond his victory over Sidious on the second Death Star. He did bring balance to the Force, and that balance would last for nearly 30 years. But due to having served the darkness for so long, he allowed the most evil man in the galaxy to have a chance at returning from the dead. Anakin had gone to the future, having used the world between worlds. He couldn't change the future from his current position in time. Cities had facilities on Exegol. He was killed during the fall and returned inside of a clone. Anakin could see the balance that be brought to the Force once again, 30 years after he did it. And while he supported this, he saw the fragility of the New Republic and how it caused so much more death and pain due to their inability to stand in an era of Imperial remnants and growing pains. That was probably the best way for him to describe the future of the New Republic, growing pains, with not enough time to fully establish itself. It was a government that continually failed its people, and its failure to prepare led to it being obliterated by one of Sidious's contingency plans. It was Anakin who realized the death of which Palpatine's brilliance went. He would go to the end of the galaxy to make sure he stayed in command of it, whether it was Operation Cinder or Project Necromancer. All of them were in the service of the greater good of his evil regime. Anakin believed that Rey and Ben's heroic sacrifices were rightly placed, and they were honorable in their own right. But his hopes were that perhaps Ahsoka could finish her training with him, and that she could help prevent Sidious from ever being able to rise to a power like the power he planned to have with the Final Order. Skywalker saw everything that Sidious was able to accomplish, and as he went back through the years, he realized that there was only one person who could legitimately do anything. Obi-Wan would never leave Tatooine, and neither would Yoda leave Dagobah. Skywalker needed to rely on the only other person he could trust, which was his former student. He couldn't choose any other time, because Sidious was able to establish so much for himself in the later days of the Republic. Obviously for Ahsoka, this was a lot of information to take in, and technically, Skywalker wasn't breaking the rules. He unveiled everything that he could, he didn't give all the details just mentioned. However, as he understood, as long as it resulted in the same technical ending, then it would be fine, which he trusted Ahsoka to be capable of doing. He then continued and told her that the burden wouldn't be on her if she wanted to reject it. However, the galaxy was counting on her for one final mission. She didn't quite understand what the lesson was, and Anakin knew he couldn't fully tell her the truth. It was mixed. He could inform her of what became of the galaxy, the rise of Sidious, the final order, but Anakin very explicitly avoided telling her the specific details. That was the only way this type of thing worked. It was the same way with Qui-Gon, how he couldn't tell Yoda who Sidious was, or why Anakin couldn't tell Luke where Exegol was, despite having been there as Vader. The Force would forbid the passing of direct information. It's why individuals who became Force Ghosts spoke in riddles. Qui-Gon was always with Obi-Wan, but never revealed it. He could not interfere. Skywalker, at that same extent, could not interfere, but he kind of was. He told Ahsoka that in the galaxy, he was consumed by Darth Vader, though there was a catch for her. Vader wasn't fully turned to the dark side. He was able to be turned, but he couldn't reveal much more than that. Ahsoka still didn't understand. What was she supposed to do? And perhaps that was the trick. One final lesson, one final time that she would see her master in the flesh. One chance to right the wrongs he left across the galaxy as the heir to his lineage. 
The two of them stood across from each other. Ahsoka had no fear of becoming Vader, because she never met him. Anakin told Ahsoka that he was always appreciative of her, which she knew, but it was nice to hear that again. Anakin told her that she had a friend that would guide her further along in her journey. He turned his head as an owl soared overhead, leaving a gentle call to let Ahsoka know that she wasn't alone. Anakin smiled at his apprentice and informed her that the path of triumph lay ahead of her. She just needed to trust herself. He always believed in her. Within a moment, she dropped back into the real world and fell to the ground. She didn't understand a whole lot of what just happened, but she looked around and pondered over how real or fake it was. She knew her master could play games with her, but this seemed every bit real, as was possible. Ahsoka had a moment to talk with Rex about what she had just experienced, and she didn't know what to do with the information. He asked her what she thought they should do, and she was still unsure. But once again, there was a call from the Force, one that came from Morai herself. The owl that once represented the daughter would complete the final stages of Anakin's request. Ahsoka would be brought to a long-forgotten place, somewhere that was abandoned due to the banishment of a singular being. Anakin understood what Ahsoka wouldn't and couldn't comprehend inside the world between worlds. Ahsoka was filled with light. She was her master's apprentice, and being that she was, she could be just like him. She could be filled with light or consumed by darkness. However, as Anakin believed, she would be able to accept the responsibility if it was bestowed upon her. Ahsoka and Rex would decide that it would be best to follow Morai. What the former clone captain would see was something that he would never be able to comprehend, not in one year or a thousand years. The two of them were brought across the galaxy. The daughter still existed within Ahsoka, and she still existed within Morai. She was a force's physical embodiment of the light. Therefore, so was Ahsoka to some degree. If Ahsoka decided to run from this, then she, like Anakin, would continue to let the galaxy suffer. The burden of pain was generational, as it passed from master to apprentice. Ahsoka didn't really understand, but she followed suit, stepping into what would be considered forsaken territory. She would bathe in the pool of knowledge and drink from the font of power. The protection of the daughter would allow Ahsoka to become one with the Force, and take up a mantle that Skywalker should have held. He passed the torch through this lesson in the War Between Worlds, but Ahsoka didn't know where to go from here. She had to admit, she didn't feel much different than she did before. It wasn't like anything changed automatically, at least in her mind. She just felt like she was doing some ritualistic movement that didn't really affect her at all. Not that she felt like she was wasting time, but now there was no direction for her. More I left and vanished, as she had before, and now Ahsoka and Rex were left with the daunting task of fulfilling Anakin's request. Rex suggested rallying together so that they could get a rebellion and fight the Emperor, but Ahsoka was doubtful. The idea was to restart the Empire as a democracy, not throw the galaxy back into war. He understood, but there was no other way for them to do that. Ahsoka considered the fact that there might be some information about Sidious that they could use to turn the Empire against him. Rex didn't know what she meant, but she informed him that Sidious was behind Order 66. He knew that, which meant he was behind the construction of the clone army for a war that no regular person would know about. Ahsoka was well aware that the title Sith would mean very little to a regular citizen or senator, but as she was able to get proof of Sidious conspiring against the Republic with either Dooku or someone else, then maybe she could have hope in turning the Empire against the Emperor. It was a long shot, and Rex even said it was, and it could be more difficult than building a rebellion. He was right, but fighting the Empire with fire would only erupt into an inferno. If they washed away the blaze, perhaps they could find renewal in the ashes. He understood where she was coming from, and then he asked where they might go to collect this information. She asked if he thought that Sidious would have gone to the Jedi Temple. Rex was unsure, but if Sidious was arrogant enough to believe he would find victory so easily, then he could have shown himself. It would be hard. Coruscant was locked down, and it would require intense sneaking around, but it could work. When they eventually arrived on Coruscant, it was very clear that this was a new era. Venators crowded the airspace over the city. Imperial occupation was militaristic in a way that the Republic never was. It was so sad to see him. And worst of all, Ahsoka and Rex used an old passageway from below the temple to get into it. What they saw was devastating. The temple was in ruins. Bodies still littered the hallways, and clones stationed inside the building were playing with lightsabers. Rex was disgusted by his own men, and even considered using his weapons on them. But instead, he pulled away from it and he and Ahsoka were on a mission, so it wouldn't be worthwhile to interact with the clones and alert the Sith to their presence. When they entered the archives, they were able to locate footage of Sidious encouraging Anakin's turn to the dark side. It was good, but she didn't believe it'd be enough to convince the public to turn against the Emperor. She would still send the information to Bail Organa to see if he could actually get some use out of it. 
Rex then had an idea. If he could sneak back with a group of regs to Kamino, he could have a chance at exposing more than what she just had here. It was difficult, but they would agree on splitting up for the time being. Ahsoka had her own mission anyways, she needed to find this Darth Vader. What came from both of their respective missions would be a whole lot of nothing. Vader was being kept in secret inside the Republic Medical Facility, while Rex wasn't even getting shipped off to Kamino. He was helping move supplies around, and that was pretty much it. Rex was wearing regular Republic Commando armor, so he blended in. Though Rex got some leeway, due to the clones moving off of Kamino, he'd be dispatched to one of three facilities. The one he was being sent to was Mount Tantus on Wayland. It was a secret facility and Rex began modifying his commando headset to capture and record everything, from interactions between scientists and the different projects apparently taking place inside the facility to other troopers. It wasn't just clones that were being brought out here, but surviving Jedi were being experimented on. The interior of the facility was a mouthful and it was hard for Rex to handle all at once. He believed that what was happening here was entirely wrong. Rex was becoming uneasy with the situation but he couldn't ignore how important it was for him to be here and stay present. If he slipped, he could lose everything, and the chance at saving the galaxy would be lost. Inversely, Ahsoka, after having struggled for weeks, would eventually find Vader inside the Grand Republic Medical Facility, which was just retitled with the Imperial name. Vader was inside of a back to tank when Ahsoka found him. He at this point was far too weak to try and do anything, but he was shocked. They hadn't found Ahsoka's vessel, and so it was assumed that she had died at the end of the war. Ahsoka took out the royal guard when she entered the room. She had time to talk to Vader. He was stuck inside the tank. He couldn't speak, so all he could do was watch. But Ahsoka just needed him to listen anyways. How was she supposed to do this? She was 17 years old, and it felt like the entire galaxy was sitting on her shoulders. So, she had a heart to heart with her former master. Ahsoka told Anakin that she knew he was in there somewhere. All of this, all of what had been done, could be fixable. He didn't have to have eternal suffering. There is more for him outside of this, but if he continued serving the Sith, he would never find his peace. Ahsoka didn't know if that was true, because she didn't have a gauge on how realistic him having peace was outside of the Sith. She didn't know about Luke or Leia. She didn't know where Obi-Wan was or the fact that he did this. She just spoke between the two of them. She made no mention of anyone else outside their conversation. She just told him that his choices could impact not just himself but those around him. She referenced countless lessons he had taught her and how they kept her alive. Ahsoka wanted him to remember those same lessons in this moment, and use it to fuel him. The Empire at one point or another was going to crumble, and if he continued to serve its Emperor, then he would go down with it. She wanted to help him as much as she could. The reality that both she and he knew is that she couldn't just save him from his own actions. She was here to save him from a future neither of them could predict. The images of Anakin in this condition would haunt Ahsoka for a lifetime, but she had faith that her visit with her former teacher would be inspiration enough for him to climb out of his hole. She believed in him, and she expressed that no matter what, she would always be appreciative of him for what he did for her. As he was there for her when she was most desperate, she was here for him. But she couldn't stay. Sidious was more powerful than she can handle at this point, at least in her mind. With the extra power gained from the font and pool, she could have the ability to defeat the Sith Lord, but there was no guarantee of that. Before Ahsoka left, Anakin gestured to a lever on the console. He wanted to say something to her, and so, she quickly pulled on it. He was hoisted out of the back to tank. He used a force to pull the respirator from his mouth. Anakin's vocal cords were already burnt, so he wasn't speaking easily, but he mustered up the strength to tell her that he was thankful for her effort to be here for him, and that he was very proud of the young woman she became. Jedi or not, he would always value their familial bond. She was his little sister after all, and she meant the galaxy to him, especially that she was still alive. It was so incredibly hard seeing Anakin in this condition, but she had to let him go. Though one rewarding thing from all of this is that once the crane lowered him back into the Bacta tank, his eyes were coated in ocean blue, just as they were before the Battle of Coruscant. The Sith Yellow had dispersed. Anakin Skywalker was reborn. She got him in time. He had returned. But that did not mean that the fight was over. Sidious was a master manipulator, and she would need to stay ahead of the curve. Anakin needed to find his way to handle this side of things. But Ahsoka moved to Alderaan to continue her own journey against the Sith Lord. Rex's recordings would also be brought to Alderaan, thanks to another cloned commando who betrayed the Empire on Tantus after having his chip dysfunction. The information alongside that of the rallying behind Bail led to him making a faulty decision. He was getting a little too into the movement, and so he propped up an alliance with Saw Gerrera. 
due to success during the restoration of Onderon during the war. What Bale didn't expect is what came from his alliance with Saul. All the recent events took place over five weeks or so. The combined intel was very important and would be useful, but due to the lack of communication, there was stagnation between the rebels. Anakin hadn't made his move yet, because he knew Ahsoka was up to something and he didn't want to disrupt it. Saul, on the other hand, was hired as an assistance to Bale, but that isn't what happened. He ended up using the extra credits to illegally purchase a shipment of explosives from clones that turned against the Empire. The clones used the credits to get out of Dodge, while Saul used the explosives to bomb a secret Imperial facility. It wasn't Tantus, but his actions resulted in the deaths of Tarkin, Orson Credit, and a number of other top Imperial officers on Eridun. One would assume that this would elicit a reaction from the Empire, but it couldn't. The officers died inside of a secret facility, one that would dictate the future of the Empire. After all, Project Stardust was one of many top secret projects that were being passed around during the meeting. If that kind of information made it to the public, it would destroy Palpatine's legitimacy as Emperor. It would show how insecure he was, but also depict him as a man driven by madness to achieve the most power possible in the galaxy. Sidious obviously was very disgruntled by the entire situation, but that wasn't the end of it. Ahsoka paired up with a couple of clones that were working with Admiral Rampart on Sereno to get information to further the destruction of Palpatine's political power. This was a point Bale pulled the plug. Rex returned from Mount Tantus, the clones who were being hunted arrived at Alderaan with their information, and the alliance with Saul Guerrero was cut short. Bale needed everything to look as clean as possible, though the question did remain. What would become of Sidious and or Vader? Ahsoka informed Bale that she would do whatever she could to make sure the transition would be attainable. She didn't know how it was possible, but she trusted the Force. Ahsoka was dealing with a bit of imposter syndrome, due to the fact that she had access to so much more power, but didn't know how to really wield it without losing control. The fear for her was becoming obsessed with power, which wasn't something she thought she would do, or at least feel like she could do. But she was her master's student after all. Bale pulled all the information together as well as his allies so that they could discuss everything. They needed to be ready. The clone army was being disbanded, but thanks to sources Ahsoka acquired on Sereno, they had a couple of hologram calls between Sidious and Dooku. The Count de Sereno had saved them for memory purposes. In his old age, he forgot a couple things, and only saved them so he could make sure everything was done to Sidious' liking at the end of the war. Due to his untimely death at Coruscant, Dooku never had the chance to get rid of them. So. Now it would favor the Republic. Had Ahsoka not found these clones, they would have been executed. They were able to give over their information and get their freedom, thanks to Bell taking care of them and getting them into secrecy. Mothma, Chuchi, and a number of other allies were being brought together on Coruscant to do everything in their power to prepare for the appropriate strategy to take down Sidious. Ahsoka was searching for a way to get him killed, and all at the same time, Sidious was trying to figure out how to use his empire to hunt down the rebels that killed his officers. All the individuals killed in Saul's bombing were integral to the future of the empire, especially Dr. Hemlock. Everyone was obviously replaceable, but this early on, he needed all hands on deck, especially the most loyal ones. With individuals as loyal as Krennic, Tarkin, and Hemlock dead, Sidious had large shoes to fill with people ready to serve him. After more weeks of preparation, the Senators would be ready, though it was clear that their actions might cause their own deaths. Ahsoka knew that she couldn't afford to leave the Senators on their own. The aforementioned New Republic suffered because of poor leadership. All of these Senators were necessary for making sure the Empire had a smooth transition. Ahsoka was able to secure a Temple Guard Pike from the Jedi Temple, just in case things went wrong. She also borrowed a Senator's gown to fit in with the rest of her allies. She was doing this not just for Anakin and the galaxy, but for her friend Padme, who would have been so proud of her in this moment. Vader was still awaiting his chance to do anything. He and Sidious were interacting with the Inquisitors. Their training arena had a massive screen inside of it, and the Senate session was being pulled up. It was another one being hosted by Masa Meda. He actually hosted all of them now, because as Visor of the Empire, that was his job. Though the Senate session was brought forward by an emergency maid by Bail Organa, which is why Sidious wanted to watch it, from here. Sidious, Vader, and the Inquisitors watched the screen. Sidious had just instructed Vader to train the Inquisitorius so they could be more of a group of Jedi hunters. Vader loathed it as much as he humanly could. However, he noticed something immediately. He saw his apprentice with Bale and the other senators. Sidious had it pulled up just in case he needed to have the senators executed on the telecasts. Once it started, he realized he needed a more effective show of force and quickly moved across the city to show it. 
people tuned in from all around the galaxy. Sidious was verbally being torn apart by Bale and his allies. They were making a fool out of him because he was exposed. The Inquisitors were all confused, each of them being former Jedi realizing how badly they had been played. Vader saw this as his opportunity, and instead of training, he began cutting through the Inquisitors. The tragedy of the situation is, the Inquisitors were all confused as it was, and they believed he was still training them. Anakin was struggling, the suit weighed him down significantly, but he was working as a beacon of light. He cut down brother and sister before engaging the Grand Inquisitor himself. The skills of Grand Inquisitor were nothing to mock, but Skywalker used all of his power to make sure the paw an Inquisitor fell victim to his blade. Inside the Senate chambers, stormtroopers and clone troopers started to rally around. Tantus was a horror show. The Empire was experimenting on clones, Jedi, and more. They didn't just destroy Kamino, they covered it up so they could perfect the art of cloning. It didn't make sense. Why clone nearly dead Jedi? Then it became apparent that Palpatine wasn't just a badly burnt politician who faced the wrath of the Jedi. It was obvious that he was some sort of evil Jedi that faked his injuries to hurl the galaxy into his control. It was a brilliant move and the Senate erupted into chaos, but as it did, Sidious arrived to try and stop the rise of anger from those who were once loyal to him. The key to the clones is that they were bred to be loyal. As it turns out, being told that your entire life purpose was meant to get some other dude into power doesn't actually sit right. The stormtroopers were also outraged. They signed up to serve the Empire, not starve their fellow Imperials for not subscribing to the Palpatine premium deal. Troopers from across the Senate aimed their weapons at Sidious. He wasn't the real leader of the Empire, he was a fraud and he needed to be dealt with. Ahsoka wanted to do something but she couldn't. Actually, maybe she couldn't. Ahsoka reached out her hands and twisted the controls on Palpatine's console, and the tower dropped from the middle of the room, as stormtroopers and clone troopers came together to open fire on the Emperor. They didn't hit their target. When the tower slammed down, Moss was killed on impact, but the Sith Lord wasn't. Vader stormed forward, waiting for this moment, attempting to kill Sidious. He was blasted with a wave of forced electricity that crippled his suit, and Vader stumbled to the ground. Anakin Skywalker was stronger than that though. He pushed himself further as Sidious unleashed more waves of powerful force lightning against him. Ahsoka could see it, and she very quickly made a move for the chambers. Vader pushed himself closer and closer. Despite the crippling damage it was doing to the man in the suit, Anakin was focused on only one objective, destroy the Sith. He was consumed with pain, but his hand found his target, wrapping around Sidious' throat and clenching. Both Anakin and Sidious dropped to the ground next to each other. Sidious was killed, but Vader still lived. Ahsoka was able to get to her former master just in time. As she did, she removed his helmet for his command. He smiled at her and told her that he knew he could always count on her. It was as if he knew all along, but that didn't make sense. She just smiled and held his hand as he fell into the Force, becoming one with it. Instead of dying, Qui-Gon pulled him into the netherworld of the Force so that he might have his own chance to help those around him. Skywalker's sacrifice would be the nail in the coffin for Sidious' empire. Once it was revealed the entire empire was a lie, all patriotism for it died out. What followed was a rebuilding of democracy, something that would be heralded in by Bail Organa and Mel Mothma, with heavy support from Ryo Chuchi. The death of Palpatine would lead to everything else that he planned on doing being exposed to the empire. The new Chancellor role would be born, but it wouldn't be as flawed as the one that allowed Palpatine to become Emperor. Instead, this particular system would rely on a three-person system of leaders one from each side of the political spectrum. Ahsoka, on the other hand, would join her best friend Rex, as he went along and helped his brothers adjust to the post-Order 66 era. It was a very difficult process, but with clones like Cody, Wolf, Gregor, the Bad Badge, Hauser, and a number of others, they'd be able to help their brothers come into their own without the need for military service. Once Ahsoka finished this process, she'd begin her own journey. She learned from Bale that Obi-Wan and Yoda were still alive. Also, the fact that Luke and Leia were Anakin's children. Ahsoka tried to reflect on what had been told to her. She went to Yoda, which inspired her to then go to Obi-Wan. Because as she was doing this, the New Republic released its grip over the Jedi, allowing them to live without being hunted down. Due to the Jedi's return, Maul would go further into the Outer Rim, but it wouldn't ever do him any good. Though thanks to what Ahsoka would build in the future, he'd find his own peace, rather than a dreary end, like the one that befell his dear old master. Ahsoka, after her visits with both Jedi Masters, would think back on her instruction with Anakin and the World Between Worlds. Instead of giving up or ceasing the care, she'd restart the Jedi Order. It would still be called the Jedi Order, and there would be some changes to their code, but she did it all in Anakin's memory. 
Ahsoka's time as Phil and Grandmaster would be challenging, but she would find comfort in her trials. At her age, it was difficult, but she would be assisted by Jedi Masters of the Fallen Order. Ahsoka's gift to the Jedi would be the spark to reignite their order. Once the order began its rebuilding process, she found solace elsewhere on her own missions. Whether they were saving younglings lost after Order 66 or bringing in new members, they were all positive experiences. When the twins were old enough, she'd tell them about the sacrifice their father made and the lasting effect it had on the galaxy. And that, my friends, is our Grand Tier Request video. Special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Django Fett, Clone, Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weebo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Sith Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galen 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Force Lake Lake Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Manthe, First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lee Denwing for supporting the channel. As was said before, this is a grand tier request, so go check out the Patreon if you want a chance to do that, or see some of the other perks of being a Patreon supporter. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. So this particular story, I was given a baseline to work with, and I took what felt most natural to go with it. Ahsoka doesn't have a teacher at this point, and I think it would be very hard for her to kind of understand or or come to terms with what would be given to her through the font and the pool of knowledge and power. So I think that for her, she would have like this imposter syndrome, kind of like what Rey deals with in the sequels. And I thought that'd be very befitting of her character, especially because she doesn't have an elder teacher to teach her how to use these powers. And so for like the year or so period that this takes place in, she'd be more focused on that final message of saving the galaxy before Palpatine can get his foot in the door. And so it felt more natural for Anakin to find his balance in the Force almost ending in a, in a poetic way where he dies in Ahsoka's arms, similar to how he died in Luke's arms. So, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.